Hi there, and thanks for joining us. My name is Annabelle Crabb, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to this latest Q&A session run by Breast Cancer Trials. Um, Breast Cancer Trials is the largest independent oncology research group in Australia and New Zealand. They've been conducting clinical trials research into the treatment and prevention of breast cancer for 45 years now. And over the last couple of years, we've run a bunch of these Q&A sessions, which is where Breast Cancer Trials collects a bunch of experts, and we ask you to come in with your questions and ask anything that's making you worried or concerned or about which um, uh, to which you don't already have the answer. And I have to say tonight we have um, an, a huge turnout, around 2,600 registrations. So thank you very much for your um, very enthusiastic interest. We've done um, sessions on sex and intimacy, breast cancer recurrence, uh, genetics in the BRCA gene and breast cancer in young women. But this is obviously a really popular one tonight. We are talking about side effects from breast cancer treatment. Now, um, I want to, before we go any further, uh, just say that uh, everybody is dialing into this session from a different part of Australia or New Zealand. Um, I'm coming to you uh, from um, Sydney um, and uh, the land of the Eora Nation. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this place and also the traditional owners of wherever, wherever it is that you happen to be sitting, perching, driving, jogging, walking around, um, tuning into this session this evening. Now, um, we're going to be talking about a lot of issues around side effects from breast cancer treatment tonight. Everybody's experience of breast cancer, of course, is different. That's why it can be so confusing. Um, and we are pulling questions based uh, on the hundreds of questions we've received, um, and they are concerning the range of side effects that different people may experience as a result of treatment. It's um, We've chosen the questions based on patterns from the many questions that we've received. We will try to get to as many as we can. So. I'd like now to introduce the panel. As ever, we have a really great um, spread of expertise for you to make the best of this evening. Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome Ms. Navina Nekalapudi, and she was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer on Christmas Eve in 2014. What a treat that must have been. And she's experienced numerous, numerous short and long-term side effects from treatment. Navina is a member of the Breast Cancer Trials Consumer Advisory Panel. Thank you so much, Navina, for being here and also for being on that panel. I know that um, it is a great guidance um, to breast cancer trials. Uh, next, we have Professor Bruce Mann. He's the Director of Research at Breast Cancer Trials, a Professor of Surgery at the University of Melbourne and Director of the Breast and Tumor Stream at the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre. What I love about interviewing, um, the, introducing these panellists is they always have lists of responsibilities a mile long, which makes us all the more grateful that they've taken a big chunk of time um, to join us this evening. Thank you very much, Bruce. Um, our next guest, uh, Jenny Gilchrist, has 20 years of one-on-one -on -one, uh, nursing experience, which is such a huge part of the patient experience of breast cancer treatment. Uh, Jenny's a nurse practitioner in breast oncology at Macquarie University Hospital. She's a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee on Breast Cancer at Breast Cancer Trials. She's cl Chief Clinical Lead for the Metastatic McGrath Breast Cancer Nurses, and she's on the Board of Directors of the Australasian Society for Breast Diseases. Welcome, Jenny. And uh, Dr. Nicholas Stenkowski is a medical oncologist, uh, a visiting medical officer at Maitland and Lake Macquarie Private Hospitals, conjoint senior lecturer in the Faculty of Medicine at Newcastle University, and the chair of the Breast Cancer Trials Scientific Advisory Committee. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to have a cup of tea after getting through all of that. Now, as I said, we've got 2,600 registered and we're going to um, start with a bit of a snapshot of all the questions that you asked. We've picked patterns of the most common ones and that's what we'll be throwing at our professionals this evening. But in the interim, here's a taste of what you wanted to know.
So you can see that as usual in these sessions, what you can hear from our questioners is always a combination of anxiety, uncertainty, confusion about options, options paralysis and fear, worry um, among some questioners for people that they love with breast cancer. And that's what we're here for tonight, to try and get a bit of that um, anxiety and uncertainty cleared up for you. I should apologise, there was a couple of glitches earlier on with the um, opening moments of the broadcast, but I'm assured that that's all cleared up now. So um, it is not you, don't adjust your set. Now, um, I'm going to introduce uh, our first poll now to get an idea of um, where you all stand. Um, if you go down to that uh, three dot bit at the bottom right hand corner of your screen, hover over that and click on the polls heading. Now, this question, the first one, um, is directed to those watching who personally have an experience of breast cancer. And we'd love you to suggest select just one from the following list. What has been your experience of side effects from breast cancer treatment? First, no side effects, minimal side effects, a number of side effects, and I've managed them the best I could. I had severe side effects during treatment and they eventually went away after treatment. I had severe side effects during treatment and I continue to have them years after treatment. And finally, I stopped treatment because because the side effects were too much. So if you can complete that, um, we should have an idea pretty quickly from a pretty large poll sample of where you all stand on that spectrum, keeping in mind that everybody experiences breast cancer in a different way. And I'll be giving you some feedback on the interim results of those polls a bit later in the Q&A. This feels exactly like the election broadcast, only um, it's not six hours without going to the toilet, so that's nice. Anyway, I'm going to start with you, Naveena. Um, Let's talk about you and your breast cancer experience. As I mentioned earlier, you were diagnosed on Christmas Eve in 2014. Just tell us how that happened. Thanks, Annabelle. Uh, back about a decade or so ago, there used to be a campaign on the first of the month to check your breasts. Um, I think it was because of you know people like Haile Minogue and so on being diagnosed. And so I did that and I felt a lump, but because all the media and everything else talks about, you know, free mammograms over 50 and uh, family history and so on, uh, I discounted it because I had, I was uh, 39 and I also didn't have any family history. I also Googled it, which was a mistake. Um, and because it said, check, you know, check uh, your breasts a couple of times a month because of the hormonal changes. And I felt it at different times of the month and it wasn't there. So I was like, oh, it's a cyst. So, you know, nothing to worry about here. Um, then a few months later, I felt a raised lymph node in my armpit and I also got a cough. And this was a few days before Christmas. So I went to see my GP and she was like, why are you here? And I said, I'll cough and raised lymph node, which I think are connected. Oh, by the way, there's this lump that used to come and go, but it's sticking around a bit more now. And she had a feel and went, oh, okay. She goes, oh, well, go get a mammogram when you have a moment. And because she wasn't that concerned and I had written it off as a cyst, I decided to do it on Christmas Eve because I wanted to get it out of the way. You know, it's a busy holiday period. Then I was back at work and it was going to be crazy busy. And so it's mostly my fault that it was on Christmas Eve because I booked it in. Um, and uh, within half an hour coming home, my GP rang me and she said, I'm so sorry to do this on the phone, uh, but because we were away over the Christmas break, but unfortunately it's cancer. And I was like, <laughs> I was sitting there going, oh, what? Um, and so, you know, that began my, my breast cancer journey, I guess. Wow. Um, gosh, that must have been um, extremely frightening for you at a really terrible time. What 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 was the treatment that you started? When did it start for you? How quickly and what exactly did it entail? Uh, so it's, um, I got to see the surgeon a couple of weeks later, which was the longest two weeks of my life, I think. Uh, but because of Christmas, January, you know, the usual uh, shutdowns. And I had a lumpectomy, which was the removal of the lump uh, itself. And I had um, the lymph nodes in my armpit removed, which was called axillary clearance. Uh, I then underwent 16 rounds of chemotherapy. So there's two different types of chemotherapy in that, three months of each and then uh, 30 rounds of radiation, which was a six week uh, program, I guess. So uh, I kind of finished it all by October, 2015. 
And how long did it take you to experience side effects? <laughs> well, there was a number of them. So we start with the surgery itself. I ended up with extensive scar tissue that started from underneath my breast up into my armpit and down my arm, and it restricted my movement of my arm beyond my shoulder. Uh, and so I had to go and get that basically massage and, and the physio had to break it, um, which was possibly one of the most painful things you can ever go through. Um, with the chemotherapy, I guess there was again, a number of them, um, you know, constipation started almost straight away. I had, um, uh, you know, the hair loss started within the first two or three weeks. Um, the, uh, I had hot flushes and night sweats because I was young. They gave me a drug called Zolidex, which was to put my ovaries to sleep to prevent menopause, if possible. Uh, and because of that, I went into fake menopause and ended up with hot flushes and night sweats. Um, and then I had blue and brittle nails, which started a, you know, a few weeks in. But by then, everything was a bit of a blur. And I stumbled across it by accident because I was looking at them in direct sunlight for a change and went, what's going on with my, and my tongue had gone blue as well at that stage. Um, and then it was joint pain. The joint pain was cumulative. So it started a little bit. And the second chemo drug I was given was called Taxol. And that causes a lot of joint pain. Um, and so that increased over time. And um, I had neuropathy, uh, which is like um, shooting pains in my extremities. And that started with the Taxol. Uh, and um, fatigue was cumulative. And lastly, chemo brain. So that started, and I didn't even realize that it started uh, because you know you don't realize you're losing uh, cognitive ability until somebody starts doing it over and over again, and people start making comments. So there's something that you're missing. So, uh, so extensive. I think, the, I think the first rule of brain fog is you don't realize you've got brain fog, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. And then with the radiation, there was the burnt skin. Uh, and the itchiness and the flaking and so on. So, um, so wow, that Navina, that's an amazing shopping list. And we're going to um, unpack um, how to handle some of these uh, side effects as we go through. Just quickly, it's nearly 10 years now since your diagnosis. Do you have any long term side effects? Um, yes, the, um, uh, the joint pain and the neuropathy has persisted. Um, and um, the cognitive impairment, partly, I think, from my treatment back then, and it's partly because of the pain medications I'm on, um, and fatigue. And the pain and the fatigue kind of go together um, a little bit because it causes insomnia and this is a cycle um, that you have to go through. So, um, yes. Wow, that's um, a long journey, Davina. I want to again thank you for um, for being here, for sharing your experience to help others, and also for being so incredibly cheerful about it. Um, um, we're very grateful, um, Nicholas. I wanted to. I've got a question that I'm asking you from, uh, up front, but I want to quickly to ask you that experience that Navina had, where she thought, "I'm only 39." She had a number 50 in her head for when she should start being worried about breast cancer. I had my first um, mammogram um, four days ago because I've just turned 50 and I thought exactly the same way. Is that, I mean, is that problematic, do you think? Does it stop people from um, taking symptoms seriously when they're younger? Absolutely. So I think that the publicity around starting screening mammograms gives people the impression that that's the age at which you can be diagnosed with breast cancer. But in reality, you can be diagnosed with breast cancer from a very young age. Um, you know, there, I've got patients who've been diagnosed in their twenties. And then people also think that after say 75, they can't be diagnosed with breast cancer either. Uh, but that's also not the case. But the reality is that the age between 50 and 75, that's the most common time to be diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's when mammograms have been proven to be effective. But if there are other factors involved there, then um, such as family history uh, or uh, indeed breast changes, uh, then that's certainly something that uh, needs to be looked into. Nicholas, um we all know that everybody's experience is different. Um, you've just listened to Navina's shopping list of um, uh, of side effects. 
are they all common ones? What are the most common ones you see and how much does it vary? Oh, look, it, Naveena's just uh, very eloquently described the range of side effects. Um, and uh, from her experience, uh, you know, she's experienced quite a few side effects, but that's not uncommon. But there is a broad range, and it depends on what sort of treatments people have received. Uh, and not everybody needs all of the treatments, uh, and some people might have surgery, some might have surgery and radiotherapy and chemo and targeted therapy and hormone blocking treatments, immunotherapy, and each of those have their own individual side effects. But some of the ones uh, that are uh, more common, uh, I would describe it as being the acute um, and the longer term. And so the acute things, things that happen uh, when there's short time frame uh, during treatment, such as chemotherapy, that then tend to uh, resolve things like nausea, uh, that generally settles um, after several days. Um, the aches and pains um, with chemotherapy usually settle down. Um, but then there are the longer term um, effects, things like fatigue that builds up uh, with chemotherapy and can persist through hormone blocking treatment. Um, there's the cognitive changes. Um, really important is the mental health side of things. Uh, and it's, of course, an impact of the diagnosis of cancer, but also of um, the uh, chemotherapy, so chemo fog. Um, there's the hormone blocking effect, uh, which also causes uh, some cognitive changes. Uh, there's the uh, the impact on uh, the nerves, so neuropathy, uh, nails, hair. Uh, I mean, it can affect anywhere in your body, uh, and uh, it's everybody's experience is different. I had never heard of the blue nails and tongue thing. That is new to me. Thank you, Nicholas. I'm going to just throw a quick question to you, Bruce. Um, this whole discussion about side effects from treatment is mainly about concerns with the quality of life of patients. So we had a question from Ivy, and she wants to know how do patients make an informed decision if they know that a certain treatment, like tamoxifen, may cause side effects? How do you weigh the pros and cons of treatment? Yeah, thank, I think it's a, it's a very insightful question and it actually answers itself. The patient should make an informed decision. So the role of the medical team is to help the person make the informed decision. Um, we know that there, and there's a few parts to it. Um, a number of the chemo side effects are predictable, a num but a number are unpredictable and particularly with the hormone blocking tablets, the side effects are quite unpredictable. There are many women who can take them with no side effects whatsoever. But if someone reads the product information, they many will assume that they're going to get, get all the side effects. So part of the job of the clinical team is to say, well, these are things that could happen, but the only way to find out whether they're going to affect you is actually to try it. And so the discussion that we have is essentially, and this is exactly what I have, we will judge what is likely to happen with no additional treatment, what's the risk of recurrence, and how can that be modified with various treatments. And then the challenge for each individual is to decide, well, according to her life situation, her values, her desires, which of the treatments would she prefer to have? And there are some times that you know, I'll say, you can choose to have it or not to have it. In your situation, I strongly advise you to have it because there's a large expected benefit. I, mm. If you don't have it, I, I would disagree with that. In the, and then at the other end, there's I really don't think you should have it because the expected benefits are so small. But in the middle, there's a whole group where the doctor or the nurse, the medical team can't tell someone what's right for them. And she, the question, Ivy answered the question, it's an informed decision. The medical staff do quite a bit. BCT information is quite helpful. BCNA's information is, is very helpful. And, and that's what it is. And with some of the treatments, and I'm sure we'll come onto it, there's the question of how long does one persist for? And we'll come back to it, but it's the same question. 
Yeah, look, I think through all of these sessions, we've established that people, particularly at the beginning of their breast cancer journey, face all of these questions and uncertainties and really hard decisions to make when you don't really fully understand all the factors. And that's why, you know, it's so valuable to have the opportunity to pick all of the enormous brains that are um, present on this panel. We've got um, some breaking news uh, from the poll. Um, there are some provisional results. They'll keep filtering through over the course of the session. But I will say that um, more than half of those of you who have participated so far, 56%, say they've had a number of side effects and have managed them as best they could. 16% um, say they've had severe side effects during treatment and continue to have them years after. And 14% have had minimal side effects. So there you're getting an idea of the spread of the experience. Annabelle, can I ask what Anthony Green makes of these results? <laughs> well, he's not giving anything away, not after that teal wave situation made things very, very difficult to spot. So I think he's waiting until the uh, results from Kuyong come in. Um, but thank you for your interest, Bruce. <laughs> um, we uh, have a video question now from Mika. I'm going to play it and then I'm going to ask Jenny to, um, to be the first to respond to Mika. Hi, I'm Mika. My question to the panel is about managing the joint and soft tissue side effects of aromatase inhibitors like letrozole and anastrozole. I understand studies in mice last year showed that these drugs have a direct impact on some parts of the inflammatory system, and I've heard some people try antihistamines to manage the symptoms. Any thoughts on that approach, please? Thanks, Mika. Look, I personally haven't heard of that one before, um, but it's worth a shot. Um, there are the certain um, side effects from Nulasta, for example, which is an injection that we commonly give through chemotherapy, where we do know that there's a histamine response and there is some evidence that claritine does help or an antihistamine. Um, look, more commonly, what we do tell people to do um, in terms of managing the joint aches and pains, there's a number of things. So firstly, exercise, and you'll hear me say this a lot throughout this session, that exercise tends to be the solution for a lot of things. We do know that people that exercise um, have a have a better experience or, you know, less joint aches and pains. Um, some people find joint supplements helpful, so things like glucosamine, turmeric, curcumin, nothing fancy, just the things that you can buy from the supermarket. But of course, you know, it doesn't work for every everybody. And I think the best thing that you can do is give it a go. Um, Anti-inflammatories, of course, can help, but we don't want you to take them long term because they can muck up your tummy. Um, but certainly, you know, if it is something that, you know, if you're having a particularly bad day, you could take a, a an anti-inflammatory Acupuncture also helps sometimes. There's lots of different things out there and there's there's lots of evidence um, to, to show that acupuncture can actually be helpful. Again, for some people it is not helpful. Uh, the other thing that we commonly do is actually try and change your tablet. So, you know, there are quite a number of um, aromatase inhibitors, um, sort of they're all cousins of each other. That's how I like to describe it. And sometimes some people tolerate one and not the other. So some people might be started on letrozole and that might not be the right drug for them. So we can switch them to an astrozole. They do very similar things. Um, but sometimes we notice that even though, you know, they're very similar drugs, the side effect profile can be quite different and one might be better for someone um, than the other. It's worth giving it a go. Navina, I know that you're an absolute mine of information for um, uh, responses to random uh, side effects. Have you got any tips for um, joints and soft tissue? Uh, thanks, Annabelle. Um, I guess what I did was I started with, um, I spoke to my oncologist at the time because, as I mentioned previously, the joint pain became cumulative. Um, and initially we got away with um, using over-the-counter kind of medication like Panadols and things. Um, but as it continued, uh, I, I spoke to my oncologist again and I went and did a breast cancer rehab program at one of the hospitals uh, and they had occupational therapists and physiotherapists and dietitians and so on as a part of that and a psychologist as well. Um, and the doctor there uh, kind of told me that, you know, it'll persist for three to six months, but after that it starts to becoming, starts to become permanent. And at that stage, I was only three months past treatment. So I was like, okay, I'm still in the okay window, it'll go away. Um, well, the thing I did learn um, during that time was uh, when I spoke to the OT and one of the physios, 
um, they gave me a couple of strategies. So, uh, especially for the neuropathy, uh, they um, they said use, for example, hand lotion. Uh, but as you are applying it, kind of streak it down each of your fingers, uh, and it kind of confuses the nerves a bit and gave me a little bit of um, comfort, I guess. Uh, the other thing they taught me to do was um, use a bowl of uh, uncooked rice and I put my hands and my feet into it uh, at different times, obviously, but uh, because the grains are cool and they are small, they kind of, again, disrupted a bit of the nerve uh, messaging, I guess, or lack of messaging, whatever happens. Um, and that kind of, again, gave me a bit of comfort, but obviously, you know, I can't walk around with bags of rice on my hands and my feet. Um, and um, the other thing they showed me was an app called Recognize, which kind of helps deal with a bit of uh, complex pain using games and stuff. So um, oh. but obviously none of the, I mean, all of those were great kind of temporary bits of relief, but uh, I ended up having to go and see a pain specialist in the end because my oncologist and then the rehab doctor both tried a combination of various pain medications and they just wouldn't take the pain away. Uh, and I still see this pain specialist and we ended up with the, with the combination of a bunch of medications and anti-inflammatory included, but I had to give it up uh, because I'd been on it for about three years and obviously long-term use of anti-inflammatories, as Jenny mentioned, causes damage to stomachs and kidneys and livers and things. And um, he was worried about that. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing for me though, on top of getting the pain down to a manageable level, my pain doctor basically said to me, look, we can manage the pain, but we're, never, we're not gonna be able to get rid of it. And that actually helped me because I stopped hoping for a cure. Uh, while there was hope in my brain, I, would, I was fighting and I would constantly be obsessing about it and worrying about it and thinking about it. And yeah. while I was stuck in that loop, I could feel the pain. Uh, once he told me manageable, that's it. And he gave me a, a level of medication I could take that uh, kept me awake, I guess, because sometimes the uh, I could take more of it, but that would put me almost in a coma. Uh, and um, as a part of that, when he said that, I went, okay, good. Okay, that's it. This is it. And I started distracting myself. So I do work like consumer advocacy, doing things like this. Um, you know, I uh, play puzzles and and uh, go out with friends and, you know, do things, garden and stuff like that to kind of distract myself uh, and not think of the pain. And that actually, to a degree, helped me. Davina, that is such an interesting response and so useful because not only have you given us the kind of content we're here for, bags of rice, nerve confusion, all cool tips, but you've also raised something really important, which is perception of pain and uncertainty about what's going to happen. Um, some certainty almost has a therapeutic value is what I'm picking up um, from uh, what you're saying. So thank you very much for your um, detailed response there. Now that we're talking about neuropathy, I'm going to ask you, Nick, um, about a question we've had from Davina, who says that during chemo, she developed tingling and numbing in her hands and fingers, and it's still there two and a half years later. How should she manage it? So uh, peripheral neuropathy, uh, which is the um, impact of, uh, in breast cancer, mostly the taxane chemotherapies, paclitaxel and docetaxel, um, is not uncommon. And unfortunately, when it gets to the point um, of developing um, a functional issue, it may not get completely better. And so it usually happens slowly. It builds up cycle after cycle um, with the chemotherapy. And the key, I think, is prevention. But we don't have any really good ways of preventing it and maintaining the dose. What we commonly do is reduce the dose or stop the treatment before it come, becomes too much of a problem. And then typically after the taxane stops, we see um, a gradual improvement in the neuropathy symptoms over the couple of years afterwards. But unfortunately, um, after about two years, it tends to plateau and we don't see much improvement uh, beyond that time. And then uh, it's a case of, uh, of managing. Um, and I think I mean, Navina's uh, comments were, uh, were excellent uh, around managing those expectations and, um, and 
and allowing um, an understanding that it's it may not get better completely and understanding that right from the start um, as well. Um, there has been some interesting um, data in prevention using um, surgical gloves that are too tight during the time of the uh, aclitaxel infusion. It was a relatively small study, uh, but I thought that was quite interesting uh, and did show that there seemed to be uh, a bit of a benefit uh, for it. Uh, and that was published last year um, for those who want to go out uh, and look for it um, the Annals of Oncology. Um, in terms of the, um, the impact, um, it's about um, whether it's painful. Um, if it's painful, then the medications can be effective. For many people, it might be uh, a numbness or a reduced sensation. And then uh, it's a, a matter of um, being as functional uh, as possible and, uh, and working out how to um, manage those um, the, the, the effects on the fingers, on the feet, wearing good shoes, making sure you don't have a rocking issue, for example, because that can then cause major problems uh, with an ulcer or damage to your feet. Um, don't burn your fingers uh, and uh, you know, knowing that it's there and it might impact on, on the function. And, uh, I'm sorry to say that we don't have good ways of fixing it and of reversing it. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm going to race you through two quick ones. Um, a lot of the, the participants here have asked about alternatives and side effects of tamoxifen. Um, how is that presently used and are there alternatives? So what I would first say is in response to the aromatase inhibitor question about joint aches and pains, tamoxifen causes much less in the way of joint aches and pains. And it's actually a good drug. Uh, and I know it's older, uh, it's been around for a long time and there have been hundreds of thousands of people so it's, uh, who've used it as um, routine practice. So tamoxifen is used in three main ways. One is in prevention of breast cancer in people who are at higher than average risk. And that's a, um, there's not a huge number of people who do that, but it is um, useful in that sense. It's used in the early stage breast cancer setting um, where it um, can certainly reduce the risk of breast cancer from returning both within the breasts and elsewhere in the body. Um, and it's still a good option for women with advanced or metastatic breast cancer to slow down the progression of the cancer. Thank you. And um, Nicola has asked, what about dental health? Is it common for treatment to affect your teeth and how should she best manage it? I think we neglect our teeth to a certain extent um, and and I, I think the Australian health system unfortunately um, has set us up that way um, which I'd like to see changed um, and so the teeth um, can be affected by chemo uh, and the gums can certainly be affected um, with dry mouth uh, taste changes uh, and then in the menopausal symptoms that we see uh, from estrogen deprivation, that also extends to the teeth and gums. So things like dental caries, loosening of the teeth um, and um, more sensitivity uh, of, of the teeth. Um, and then there are some bone targeted agents um, that we use that cause um, some significant dental problems in a very small minority of people, like zoledronic acid and denosumab. So I think it's key to maintain good oral health with um, good toothbrush and mouthwashes and to have, maintain a good dialogue with your dentist and make sure your dentist is aware of what's going on and you diagnose breast cancer, what treatments you've been on uh, so that they can talk to your oncologist just to keep everybody in the loop. Great. And we were talking earlier about a questioner who wrote in asking what the best kind of toothbrush to use is, which I thought was a kind of random question, but Navina says a soft one. Any good soft toothbrush is a good one. Is that right, Navina? Give me a thumbs up if so. Navina's got a really great list of here's what you need post-diagnosis, which if we get time later, I'll get her to rattle through. But in the meantime, um, a couple of questions to you, Bruce. Louise has asked, um, what can be done to help with lymphedema in the breast after surgery? Uh, yeah, I think it's a great question. Lymphedema in the breast is is more common than has generally been recognised. Um, for a long time, it's been lymphedema of the arm has been the focus. Since we've been doing less uh, auxiliary uh, armpit nodal surgery, uh, the amount of lymphedema of the arm is less. 
but after the surgery and radiation, a number of uh, women do get lymphedema of the breast. Uh, with all lymphedema, early recognition and treatment is, is very important. Um, and so recognising that there is a problem, referral to a, a lymphedema therapist. There are many physiotherapists with particular lymphedema interest is worth doing. Um, and the referral should be early. Uh, massage can help. There are special bras, a lymphedema bra that, that um, essentially is a continuous massage. And with that, usually it does work. And experience is that most women find that it does settle down with time. I suspect Jenny may have further comment. I know she has great interest in lymphedema. Uh, there might be something I've missed there. She's shaking her head. I've got it all. <laughs> Don't put it in rice. That's hands and feet. Okay. Um, what about Emma? She wrote, you might have seen this in our first little video, a very sad question. She said, listen, my treatment has left me feeling 30 years older. My worst days, I question whether the treatment is worse than the disease. What Emma wants to know is, is there any research or advances with post-treatment medications? Hmm. Um, post. So... I think comments like that, uh, reflections like that are quite common and often it's a little difficult to define what is like when one is 10 years older, one feels 10 years older from the effects of treatment, but no doubt the effects of treatment are there. I will come back to Jenny's comment that exercise is critical and I think that applies at all stages of life. When someone comes like uh, with those concerns, we do have to dissect out, you know, what what might be due to the treatment and what might be unrelated problems. There are other medical problems that people who've had breast cancer can uh, uh, experience. Um, if it's an endocrine therapy or hormonal therapy issue, quite often coming off the tablets for six weeks, uh, a bit of a holiday. Uh, to see whether there is a difference is helpful. Uh, we're confident that that doesn't have an impact on the risk of recurrence, but it can clarify whether whether the what a person is feeling is due to the treatment, and then she can make back to the informed decision whether to keep going or not, or whether perhaps a GP needs to look at, at other causes. Some of the chemo side effects you know, are long-term and difficult to address. Um, that's that's the way that I will uh, address a problem like that. But also there, there is reassurance that what we're hearing is normal. And sometimes, I don't, not often, but it's the reflection that, you know, this treatment was necessary for a, a serious disease um, and um, you know, it's uh, treatments do have costs and we can't pretend that they don't. Thank you for that thoughtful response. Um, we, we're talking about fatigue in a minute too, and I wonder if Emma's feeling um, prolonged fatigue as a side effect, among other things. Um, Jenny, a couple of questions now for you, and this is something we talked about in one of our first sessions, well, that I was involved with anyway, um, about sex life and side effects. Nola says that... Since completing chemotherapy, she's suffered from extreme vaginal dryness. She's had hormone positive cancer and asks, asks are there remedies available? Yes, unfortunately, um, you know, vaginal dryness and vaginal issues um, can occur, well, they do occur very common, uh, very frequently with patients that are undergoing any type of cancer treatment. Um, it doesn't get talked about a lot because it's a bit of a taboo taboo subject, Naveena's shaking her head. Um, but look, there are lots of different things that we can do, um, particularly obviously with someone who's had a hormone positive cancer, we don't want to be giving them sort of um, estrogen. You know, that that's the first thing to say. And typically, you know, if you're menopausal and you haven't had cancer, that would be what, you know, the GP might do. They might put you on HRT. Um, firstly, what we would recommend is using vaginal moisturisers. 
So things like Replens, um, there's another one called Olive and B Intimate Cream. Those things, uh, those vaginal moisturisers, using them on a regular basis can actually help. Um, using lubricants, so silicon-based ones tend to be a little bit better than water-based lubricants. So um, silicon ones uh, like Astroglide, using those when you're getting jiggy with it, um, that can help. <laughs> So are those two products different, Jenny? Sorry to interrupt, but like, so vaginal moisturiser. Yeah, they so have a vaginal moisturiser is more of a long-term, sort of has a longer oh. effect, whereas a lubricant has a shorter effect. Um, and so we try to sort of say those things. Um, and then, you know, if all of those things have failed, then there are some hormonal treatments such as Vagifem Low, which have been proven to be safe. Um, there are still some clinicians out there will say that they're not safe, but they have been studied quite extensively. And, and there is evidence to show that um, the systemic level of estrogen is very, very small. So it's never a first resort, but it's not something that we definitely write off. You know, it is important. We want these um, patients to be on these drugs for, you know, sometimes 10 years is it's really important that we spend the time to figure out um you know how to manage the side effects because if people stop them you know they're not going to be getting any benefit um so yeah it is time it is important to take the time to work through some of these issues thanks jenny and just quickly a, a, a few people have asked about loss of libido something we covered in that um former um q a um and i wonder if you could answer uh, the question of whether libido comes back after treatment, typically. That's a tricky one. Um, look, it's, it is something that doesn't necessarily come back and it's, it's not, it's linked to a lot of different things. So obviously it's linked to the issues with the vagina, the physical issues, but there's a lot of psychological issues that can contribute to loss of libido. So I think things like anxiety and depression, fatigue, body image issues, a lot of patients that undergo breast cancer surgery have a lot of issues with their body. Um, and, you know, medications that we give you, of course, the aromatase inhibitors, tamoxifen, they can all contribute to loss of libido. Um, look, for some people it does come back for some people it doesn't come back um i guess things that you can do to try and improve it um try and fix the underlying cause so you know if you've got issues with body image and and depression and anxiety all of those things address those things the most common thing that we tell people to do is sort of um speak to a clinical psychologist um or a sexologist or a sex therapist um go with your partner you know work through those sorts of things and i guess the most important thing to recognize is that you know there are other ways um to be intimate rather than um just doing the deed you know touching kissing um, imagery you know we try to get people to focus on those sorts of things um, and then work with a clinical psychologist to get over some of the barriers that are that are contributing to the issue and exercise, so exercise increases endorphins oh. stop saying exercise, everybody it's so depressing when they fix this <laughs> exercise rather than dark chocolate or something um so we're running about 12 minutes behind. I'm going to try and gallop through as many questions as I can because I know you've all put a lot of work into submitting them. Um, uh, we have a video question up next, and this one is from Gay about fatigue. So once this video plays, I'm going to ask Nick to jump in with a response. Hello, my name's Gay. I was diagnosed in 2010 with ductal invasive carcinoma. I had two, two rounds of surgery, six rounds of chemotherapy, radiation and hormone therapy for six years. My question to the panel is, is fatigue this far down the track after 13, almost 13 years, still reasonably normal? I still suffer from time to time with extreme fatigue and really still have to pace myself. On the whole, very healthy, very happy and very glad to be here, but still get that bit of fatigue now and then. Thank you. Yeah, so that's a um, very important point. Fatigue is one of those very common 
side effects. And I'm not going to labor the point about exercise, um, but I agree completely with Jenny and all our patients will tell me that I go on about exercise far too often as well. Um, but the fatigue can be multifactorial and yes, it can last for a long time afterwards. Uh, and it can be related to the chemo. It can be from the hormone blocking treatment. Uh, it can be from lack of sleep. Uh, it can relate to your mood as well and mental health. So optimize all of that, thinking about this concept of sleep hygiene um, and of pacing yourself, um, getting some enough physical activity, and that can actually make you um, feel a bit better. Uh, and to um, to realise that uh, perhaps you do have to um, be a, a little bit, unfortunately, more um, limited in what you do. The, the other thing is that over time, people might stay on these endocrine therapies for five or 10 years and you get older during that time uh, as well. And so there is an element of ageing uh, that occurs during that time that contributes to the fatigue. Naveena, how did and do you manage fatigue? Um, I find fatigue for me was two because of two factors. One was stamina. Um, and so because I had the joint pain and so on, I found standard exercise difficult to do. Uh, and my stamina had bottomed out because I had overcaring parents who thought I was dying and, you know, wouldn't let me lift a finger. And so I needed to build it back up again. And so what I decided to do was learn to swim uh, because that took the pressure off my joints. I got to learn a new skill and, um, you know, it, it, it helped build my stamina. I also used, uh, did water aerobics. So all of this pre COVID, you know, they then closed the pools, which was unfortunate. Um, and the other thing, thing I do around the sleep is I try to sleep at the same time every day, you know, avoid screen time after nine. I try to avoid naps, but there are times, like Gay said, there's times when I just have to go to sleep right now and, you know, act like a light, but you, know, you just have to deal with it and, and, and work your way around it. And um, I try and make my room comfortable. So uh, my, I feel like my body temperature was elevated post-treatment. So I always sleep with the fan on, you know, light doona, cotton pajamas, you know, those sort of things. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, Ariana Huffington suggests um, having really nice pajamas and sheets and viewing sleep as a special treat that you're giving to yourself and put your phone away and don't have it next to the bed. A lesson I'm yet to learn, I must say. Um, <laughs> Bruce, I've got a couple of questions. Well, I've got one question for you, for you actually, from Phaeton, who's asked, with all the knowledge that we have about breast cancer, is there an alternative to chemotherapy? Um, it comes to, so there are a number of systemic therapies that are very helpful. These are therapies given to reduce the risk of, of the disease recurring. Uh, hormonal blocking tablets uh, is an alternative to chemo. Um, and in that, the important subtype of the hormone positive and HER2 negative type of cancer, this is, this is the group where a decision to recommend or, or not recommend chemotherapy is most difficult. There are technologies of the microarrays that are widely available that unfortunately have not yet been significantly funded in Australia. Uh, tests like PAM50, like Oncotype like EndoPredict, and they're, they're, they're tests that can help determine whether chemotherapy would add anything. Um, other areas, there's in the triple negative subtype, that's the, a common type that are not hormone sensitive where chemo has a major role, a lot of investigation is going into the role of immunotherapy and BCT is involved in a number of trials there. Currently, you know, it's, it's developmental, experimental, and generally used in addition to chemo. In the HER2 positive type, that's the, the type where the, the Herceptin, uh, we have another trial that's actually called Decrescendo, which is a trial aiming at, at identifying a group who can reduce chemo. The answer is, and this is going to be a plug for BCT, it's an area, it's recognised need. There are a lot of potentials, a lot of trials are happening and, and there are developments. If there's one thing that we as a, you know, as a community need to advocate for, it is funding of 
the microarrays, these are tests that can identify substantial groups of, of women who can safely avoid chemo, and yet another plug for BCT. We're about to start the Optima trial, uh, which is directly asking that question. So um, great interest, but if you go through that, uh, I, haven't, I haven't said we can do it just yet. Thank you. Um, I know there's a lot of exciting work going on and I want to throw in a thank you to all the participants who put their time into participating in these trials, even when they're in phase one stage, because it's a very generous thing to do to create um, uh, knowledge and insight um, that will benefit other people as well as uh, potentially yourself. Uh, we've got a great question that's come in uh, from Faye. Faye says she's 82 and she wants to know if side effects from treatment are different for older women compared to young women. I'm going to throw that at you, Nick. So, yes, there are differences between older and younger women. Um, one good thing uh, for women who are older and further from their natural menopause is that they're less likely to experience the menopausal type symptoms like hot flushes uh, because they've been um, used to the lower level of estrogen that's associated with menopause. Uh, but I like to look at it not as chronological age, but biological age. Um, so how old um, is that person in, the, in their body and how many of um, the other health issues do they have? Because that ties into the range of side effects that might be experienced. Uh, and, uh, and so as they uh, accumulate more and more health conditions as you get older, then you're more likely to um, experience side effects from, uh, from any of the treatments. Thank you. And at some point during this, um, these sessions, we always come up against diet. Um, Linda, who's a nurse, said that she found relief from symptoms like nausea and constipation through natural foods. Is there any right or wrong when it comes to diet during and after treatment? And what have you noticed can be helpful? So um, diet, um, we all hopefully like to eat and uh, we do it multiple times each day, so it's something that's on our minds. And uh, and then we like to eat um, the right food, but we also like to eat um, enjoyable food. And there are some rights and wrongs. Uh, the first is with chemotherapy, there is a specific diet that we recommend that people follow, uh, and that's mainly for safety to avoid uh, the infections that can sometimes occur through food. And um, the, uh, apart from that, after a diagnosis of breast cancer, I, my suggestion is that uh, the diet be a uh, balanced, normal diet. Uh, most people don't need supplements unless they've got specific deficiencies, uh, but a, food, a, a diet that's uh, got lots of whole grains, lots of vegetables, um, a reasonable amount of fruit, not too much animal fat, um, and um, you know, things like the Mediterranean diet, so vegetable fats, uh, not too much alcohol. Um, and you know, whilst alcohol is a risk factor for developing breast cancer, um, a low level of alcohol um, infrequently does not increase the risk by very much at all. Thank you very much. And um, we're going into hair next, but I wanted to divert past Navina because I know that she has some dietary suggestions and experiences, not all of them 100% healthy. Navina? Hi, Annabelle. I think you were referring to my comment about ice cream earlier, perhaps. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess a lot of it has to do with just healthy eating, and it doesn't matter, I think, if you're a a uh, cancer patient, a uh, cancer survivor, or a general human being, you know, healthy foods, minimizing alcohol, minimizing, you know, sugar, and so on. So um, I try to do that, but I, I don't always succeed. Um, and the comment about ice cream was one of, um, because I went through my chemotherapy in, in the summer, I remember grabbing a spoonful because it was so hot and think, yeah, the metallic taste is gone. And then a friend of mine telling my friends and one of my friends sending me six tubs of ice cream uh, a couple of days later, I kept blaming her for my weight gain. So uh, <laughs> she, she would get messages from me regularly. So. Well, look, on that subject of weight gain, Jenny, um, Sandra's asked, why is it that some people gain weight and others don't during treatment? 
Good old hormones. Everybody's different, I guess, is the answer to that. And I think naturally, even with menopause, um, some people will put on weight. Some people don't put on weight. Unfortunately, it's just up to the, you know, it's, it's, everybody's different. Hormones do different things to different people. Some people go crazy when they're premenstrual and some people are perfectly fine. That's another example. Okay, hair. Everybody thinks about hair when they think about chemo. Um, Josephine has got a question for you, Jenny, which is she says she lost most of her body hair during treatment and now it's growing back darker and thicker than before. She's asked if you have any recommendations for hair removal or will it get will it change over time? Yeah, we also don't tend to tell people that, that it all goes. Um, look, it, it comes back um, often darker and thicker or grey because um, the hair follicles are damaged. There's no right or wrong way. Just get rid of it any way you want. Get rid of it waxing, you know, shaving, laser. It doesn't really matter. Um, it will improve. So as the hair follicles repair, you know, your hair will return to its, its previous um, state. So I'm sure Navina can attest to hair regrowth and how it was initially and as opposed to how it is now, which looks awesome. It does look awesome. <laughs> I was telling Navina that my sister-in-law who lost her hair, which had always been long and dark, has just used this as an excuse to go through some absolutely fabulous hairdos um, subsequent to uh, her recovery. Um, we've got a question. We, we, we talked about brain fog about 15 minutes ago, and I immediately forgot all about it because of probably brain fog. Um, but we do have a question on exactly that topic from Luann, and I'm going to ask Nick to answer it after we've uh, all watched it. Hi, my name is Luan and I have a history of breast cancer and I work as a patient advocate for breast reconstruction. Thank you so much for hosting this Q&A on the side effects of treatment. My question is in relation to cognitive impairment or brain fog. It's one of my most distressing long-term side effects of treatment, um, but whether it is of the treatment of chemotherapy or of the shock of a diagnosis or the surgical menopause that I'm in now, I'm not really sure and it's difficult to kind of unravel. My question revolves around, are there any current trials that are happening to try and reduce this particular side effect? And are there any trials that are happening or planned to happen to look to put together supportive care for people who are living beyond intensive um, active treatments and can have a support package in place so that they can overcome this long-term side effect. Thank you. Thanks, Luan. It's such a pervasive effect uh, from the diagnosis through to uh, the chemotherapy. So there's this chemotherapy fog um, that can persist and then beyond chemo through to the endocrine therapy, which can also cause that cognitive change. And it might be fairly mild, and for some people it can be severe. The um, Again, there is some data to suggest that exercise uh, during chemo can help reduce the um, impact of chemo fog. Um, there is definitely a need for more trials. Um, and I think uh, some uh, opportunities for consumer-led research uh, around the fog that we see uh, and how to improve on that. I, you also um, can't get an impact from the treatment that you don't receive. And that's where I'd also like to give a plug for some of the trials that um, BCT is running on de-escalation, so doing less treatment um, with uh, for certain people who are well selected who may do just as well without that treatment and and therefore uh, limiting the impact of those side effects. I'm quite interested in um, the neuroplasticity concepts uh, around uh, doing new things, trying new things and uh, exposing yourself to a range of different uh, opportunities to help your brain remodel. Uh, and it's a, in the meantime, uh, it is a matter of getting around it um, and doing um, the best that you can uh, by um, using shortcuts, uh, concentrating when you're best at concentrating, avoiding trying to double um, to uh, multitask because I think that that's a bit of a myth. <laughs> wow, that uh, rules out a lot of life for a lot of busy people. <laughs> um, 
That's all great advice. Um, thank you, Nick. Um, we've got half an hour to go and loads of questions to get through. So I'm going to rattle through and I know that our panel will work with us to try and get through as many as we can. Um, we, uh, Bruce, we had a question from Mary asking, how do you manage the side effects of hormone treatments? Yeah, I think we've partly answered that. The, you know, there's, there's various things. We'll come back. Exercise often helps. Um, a lot of them, it depends what they are. Um, Jenny talked about the vaginal dryness, which is quite a problem. That's, that's essential. Uh, acupuncture can help, particularly the joints. Some of the supplements can help. Uh, we can always think about the, the drug holiday for a while changing the dose, sometimes reducing a dose, uh, then there are medications that can help, particularly with hot flushes. We sometimes use Effexor. Um, it's an antidepressant, but it can have an effect. Um, I think the message is there are a lot of things that can be done, and it's very important that the treating team knows about the side effects. I recall a few patients where I look at my notes after at five years and say, well, it looks like you've had no side effects throughout the last five years. We might as well keep you going. And the husband look at her and say, well, why don't you tell him? And, and it turns out that there had been a lot of side effects that the patient had thought were inevitable and she should just put up with them. And I think that was an error. So let the team know because there are things we can do. But if we don't know, we can't help. Yeah, and I guess sometimes if you're feeling confused and anxious and foggy, some of these things just you can't remember right. what normal feels like, right? Um, well, and bring 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 the friend, bring the person to actually say, you know, you're not here to please your doctor. You're here to be helped by your doctor. Great, great point. Um, Jenny, we've got a very specific question from Anna who wants your advice on how to manage hot and cold flushes. Effects or is one option, says Bruce. And what else can you recommend? Um, so exercise, say it all together, exercise actually helps as evidence to show that it does help. Um, I guess, look, sometimes I tell people they can try evening primrose oil. Again, that can be a little bit homeopathic. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, acupuncture, again, practical things uh, like wearing cool cotton clothing, um, you know, light bed sheets, you know, um, fans in summertime, jump into the pool, all of those things. Um, and look, we do sort of don't, I don't tend to use the medications, you know, uh, sparingly. Um, you know, a lot of people try all those things and they really just don't work. Um, so yes, we do use certain drugs like Effexor. Um, Pristique is another one very similar. Um, I think sometimes they help because they've got a bit of a dual benefit as well. People often are, are struggling with some mood changes from the endocrine therapy. So if you give them an antidepressant, that kind of helps that aspect and that actually helps the hot flushes as well. There's another drug called oxybutynin, which is used for bladder spasms. That, there's some evidence to show that that helps as well because some people don't want to take the antidepressants. Um, but lots of those, those practical things, like just try and do anything you can to stay cool, cotton clothes. Yep. Great. And uh, Nicole has also asked what sort of things you recommend for survivor care and what would be the most beneficial to include in a self-care program more generally? Look, I think the most important thing is to be kind to yourself. You know, people put all this pressure on themselves to recover in a certain amount of time and get back to the way that they were. But who wants to go back to that crazy person that you were before when you were running around like a lunatic? Um, you know, just take some time out for yourself. Um, meditate, you know, take five minutes, do some mindfulness. Writing things down can actually be very helpful. Again, there's been studies looking at journaling and that that find, there's evidence to show that that does help people move forward with their through the cancer experience. It can be quite traumatic for a lot of people. Um, and as much as people all get through it and, you know, they've got the fight or flight response happening, they just go and they get through it often when they finish all their treatments and then the oncologist says, go away and I'll come back in a, come and see me in a year. And the surgeon says, come back and see me in a year. That's when everyone falls to pieces. So I think exercise, obviously try and live a healthy life. You don't need to be, you know, my body's a temple kind of people, but you know, well-balanced diet, um, you know, minimum, minimal alcohol intake, all of those things. That's just general life 
advice. It's really important to focus on the mental health side of, side of things. There are some group programs in New South Wales, for example, we've got the Encore program, which is um, an eight-week program run by volunteers and it combines exercise and education. Um, so those sorts of things can be quite good. There are support groups as well. Um, not everybody's into support groups, but you know, for some people they find them helpful. Um, clinical psychologists if you need um, and I think just you know be aware of what your what the follow-up protocol actually is usually um, you know we, we like you to see the doctor every three three to four months um, you know rotating between the specialist between the, the surgeon the breast oncologist or the medical oncologist and the radiation oncologist usually you have your annual surveillance so your mammogram ultrasound um, once a year um, just be aware of, of those sorts of things, get to know your body, but yeah, just don't put too much pressure on yourself. It'll take its own time and, you know, everyone becomes a better version of themselves at the other end of it. So that's a great point to make. Um, I think when we've talked in some of these sessions before to psychologists, they will point out that sometimes when you go through this experience, there'll be people around you who are expecting you to react in a certain way. There are all of these kind of grand myths about being a courageous warrior and all that sort of thing. Um, but of course, you've got to embrace your own experience of what's happening to you. Navina, um, I was wondering if you could make any recommendations of good resources that, that you found that you um, could recommend. Um, I, 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 sorry, I had to, <laughs> the brain fog kicking into the cognitive impairment. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, Jenny was talking about, you know, um, support groups and so yeah. on. I just wondered yeah. if, if can you think of any particular resources that you've found surprising or helpful um, that you, or that you often recommend to people? I was, um, there's a couple of them. One is uh, Breast Cancer Network has a app called My Journey, uh, and it's really, uh, really helpful. It has uh, articles, it has online forums, um, it can work offline, uh, and you can tailor it. It has a thing called a symptom tracker as well. Um, so you can actually keep track of all your side effects as they happen and then show your healthcare professional when you see them, as opposed to going, I think last week my pain was about a seven and you know, those things, or if you have a rash, you can take a photograph of it. Um, so it has all of that sort of capability. Um, and cancer councils tend to have um, quite a bit of information and fact sheets uh, around various things to do with uh, all types of cancer, but obviously breast, breast cancer as well. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think those were the two most most helpful things um, as if you try to avoid Google, basically. <laughs> All right, that is um, a perpetual piece of advice that we hear in these um, panels, don't Google things. Um, and thank you, Naveen, I think your brain fog seems to be fine. Um, you're making a lot of sense to me. Um, back to fingernails, because um, that was new to me. Um, Maria has asked specifically about this, and I'm, I'm going to ask you, Nick, to engage with this question. Maria asks, um, her fingernails and toenails have side effects. Is this an area where other health professionals can get involved in care like podiatrists? Look, I think we can um, all um, value the expertise of the broader healthcare team and having uh, podiatrists um, involved uh, is very worthwhile. Uh, I think we just need to communicate and make sure that uh, they don't go too gung-ho uh, with um, their treatments during chemotherapy because of the potential for um, introducing infection uh, into the bloodstream if somebody's immunocompromised. Uh, but certainly uh, it's um, valuable um, to work on the nails. Uh, and, and so fingernails and toenails uh, can certainly be damaged by chemo um, and it takes time for them to grow back and be patient about it uh, because they, um, they're affected right back at the root and then they eventually grow out uh, and just keep those, um, those nails uh, well looked after whilst they're repairing. Okay, thank you, Nick. And um, just quickly, Kelly has gone uh, back to hair and she wants to know um, if there's anything she can do to stop her hair thinning while being treated. 
So I um, will take it that's talking about chemotherapy. Now, we do have a relatively new um, technology called scalp cooling. Um, so we um, have the ability to use these um, big and quite expensive machines um, with a cold cap that fits really tightly on the scalp. And that helps to um, reduce chemotherapy-induced uh, hair loss, but it doesn't work for everybody. Sometimes it's due to the um, contact with the scalp cooling cap. Some people just don't tolerate it. They find it produces headaches or migraines. It is very cold. It's, they talk about it being a, um, an ice cream type headache particularly for the first 15 minutes, but, not, but you don't get the pleasure of actually eating the ice cream. Uh, and, and so they say about 50% of people will uh, be able to avoid having a um, scarf or a wig as a result of, of scalp cooling, but there still may be some thinning and, and patchiness. Uh, so that's, uh, that's what we have to offer um, for chemotherapy-induced hair loss. Great. Thank you, Nick. Um, and um, Navina, ever helpful, has let me know in the chat that one of her um, pieces of advice for the nail issue is start using dark nail polish like black or dark blue or brown, which protects the nail bed and also gives you a new look, which is um, always a good option in these circumstances in the interim. Okay. So, um, Jenny, when staff at Breast Cancer Trials were looking at all the questions that were coming in for this topic, there were some really common phrases that tended to recur. Is this normal? I felt crazy. I felt out of control. How long will this last? I want to know how you work with patients on the mental toll that treatment and uncertainty and options paralysis can have and what support's available. Getting a diagnosis of cancer is mentally challenging. And I think, um, you know, people are scared. They think they're going to die and then chuck in some hormonal changes. And yes, you do feel like you're going crazy. I think the main thing to focus on is sort of to tell people that it's okay to not be okay. Um, you know, none of us know what it would be like if we were going through it. Um, talk to someone. Uh, is is really, really important. That might be a clinical psychologist, it could be a partner, it could be family, friends, the dog, doesn't matter. Just just get it out. Um, you know, it, and it's okay to say it's crap. It is crap. No one expects you to be happy and, you know, all the time. And as much as the health professionals, we sit there and we say, you can do this and you're going to get through it, and we don't necessarily bang on the negative side of things, um, you know, it is it is crappy. We know that. So it's okay to say that, you know, you're upset and, and it's okay to recognise that. I think, look, there are lots of support groups out there. Um, look Good, Feel Better is another one that I do strongly recommend to patients. They give you lots of... Um, practical tips and tricks to get through um, treatments like chemotherapy. And I think the good thing about something like look would feel better is that you're not sort of sitting around in a circle, you know, singing Kumbaya, you know, you're doing something practical. So I think it, it sometimes is a little bit better for some people that don't want to, you know, don't want the spotlight on them. I guess the other thing that I'm going to say to patients is accept help. There are lots of people out there who will no doubt offer you help and accept that it is okay. It's not a sign of failure, but people feel like they want to do something. And so it's better for them to do something for you that you want or you need as opposed to them doing something completely useless. So I think if people are offering help, tell them what you need, um, but just be kind to yourself. It's okay to not be okay. And you will get through it. Everybody gets through it. And everything that you are experiencing is actually only temporary. You know, it will get better over time. Even the fatigue, as much as, you know, Navina still has fatigue and lots of people still have fatigue, I can almost bet my life that the fatigue is not as bad as it was before. It is a little bit better. You will get through it. It'll pass. Thank you so much, Jenny. Um, Bruce, um, we do receive a lot of questions about the fear of recurrence and we've done a whole Q&A session on this, but there's a specific question from Carol who wants to know if there is a greater risk of breast cancer coming back if you stop your medication early. Um, so I think the answer has to be yes, in that we recommend a treatment for a certain time because the evidence is that that minimises the risk of recurrence. Um, and therefore, if if one decides to cease early, that risk would be greater. But we have to be careful here 
often the situation is the risk of recurrence is objectively very small and we're making it even a little bit smaller. And I think there are many people who the side effects of the treatment induce fear of cancer recurrence. So yeah. they're getting these things, it's a reminder of the cancer and then they become worried. So is the risk greater? Yes, a little bit um, overall. In some circumstances with high risk cases, we know that the risk is quite high and you know the, the benefit from treatment is, is large. Ceasing it early, objectively, that puts one at risk. It's a choice whether to do it or not. But we have got some evidence that, that side effects of treatment can cause a fear of cancer recurrence. They don't cause the recurrence, but if we're talking about the fear, it, it's, it's a complex area. And I'll come back to our research strategy. The whole area of fear of cancer recurrence is one that we're, we're going to pay attention to because it does seem that it is underappreciated uh, and needs some needs some uh, more attention. Yes, and I'm sure that um, everybody, well, a lot of people on this um, on this session would be familiar with the concept of scanxiety, where you have specific psychological responses just to the ongoing um, checks that you're um, that you're having. I'm going to go now to the second poll. Um, this one is one where you can nominate um, a few different responses because the question is, and you need to go down to the bottom right of your. Um, uh, screen and click on polls. The question is, what's the most important long-term side effect of breast cancer treatment that you think needs research to better understand and manage? You are allowed to choose more than one option. And those are breast pain, lymph lymphedema, fear of cancer recurrence, peripheral neuropathy, chemo fog, cognitive impact, uh, joint pain and stiffness, hot flushes, sexual health, cardiotoxicity uh, or something else not in this list. And I'll be letting you know the provisional results of that poll before the end of the Q&A, which is marching up on us pretty soon. And Breast Cancer Trials will also be sending out a survey tomorrow. So if you want to add more comments about this topic, um, please do, because um, it's all super useful feedback. Now we've got a video question from Catherine, which I'm going to ask uh, Bruce to answer. Hi, my name's Catherine. Um, my question for the panel is, um, what sort of research is being done into the long-term side effects of radiation? I ask this because I'm now experiencing severe side effects two years after actually completing my radiation. And I'm wondering if I would have actually chosen to complete the radiation if I was aware of the possibilities. Thank you. Uh, great question. and. Um... It's, it's a theme, reducing, identifying those who can safely avoid radiation is, is one of our uh, major sources of um, topics for, for research. One of the things that's happened over recent years is alternative approaches to radiation are getting a lot of attention. Uh, one of the things has been reducing the number of fractions, the number of uh, doses of radiation, um, by doing that, we've actually found that, that we can get a similar um, effectiveness with less toxicity. And more recently, that's being taken uh, a long way down to just five fractions. Um, partial breast radiation, not radiating the entire breast, uh, that, that is another area. Um, and then there are trials trying to identify people who can safely avoid radiation. I think the point uh, from Catherine, wasn't it? The long-term side effects, these are really important because radiation is something that there can be long-term side effects. So uh, it is a really important area for study. Great, thank you. Um, I've got a question now for Nick. Um, now we know that genetic test and testing can show whether someone has a higher risk of being diagnosed with breast cancer. But Fiona's asked a really interesting question, which is can genetic testing now, or would it be able in the future conceivably, uh, to indicate if someone is more prone to harmful side effects? The, the genes we know about that predispose to breast cancer are uh, being uh, fairly well established and 
often it's a single gene that contributes to that risk of breast cancer. Now, when you're thinking about the risk of side effects, it's much broader and it's probably a range of different genes. And so that's quite a bit harder to really um, research and understand. There are a couple of genes that certainly do predispose to side effects from particular drugs, uh, but it depends on the um, the individual genes um, and the drug that's been used. Uh, and so that's an area that um, we, uh, it's complex um, to understand uh, and uh, requires large number of um, patients of their experiences and understanding um, what sort of side effects um, they've had, uh, as well as uh, getting a sample of their uh, DNA um, to be able to uh, understand it all and put it together and some very, uh, very clever people and large computers to, to, uh, to help it all out there. Uh, but it, it, is, it is something that uh, is being researched internationally. Thank goodness for clever people and large computers, sometimes in tandem. Um, Nick, one more for you. Pamela has asked about metastatic breast cancer. She asks where research is going to improve treatments so they have fewer side effects. So there's, um, it's very common now for us to add patient reported outcome measures into our trials to understand directly from the people who are experiencing those new treatments as to how it's impacting on their quality of life. And so that allows the treating team to really communicate well with that person as to what sort of side effects they might be likely to experience directly from other patients who've had it, rather than trying to guess uh, from what the doctors have said um, they think the patients are experiencing. Uh, and so that allows us to tailor from a side effect perspective with metastatic disease, where you're very much aiming for good quality of life as well as quantity of life. And, um, and the other thing is giving patients the treatments that are effective but have the fewer side effects. And so there's been a very interesting trial that was presented last year um, showing that a, um, a treatment that's a hormone blocker plus a cell cycle inhibitor actually um, seem to do better than what we thought was necessary, which would have been previously chemotherapy, which can cause more side effects. Uh, so there's, um, there's data coming through from those to try and optimise people's quality of life. Smart people, big computers. Thank you, Nick. Um, I want to turn now just to this question of how women report experience and feel about having side effects. Um, now, Bruce obviously mentioned earlier this phenomenon of um, women not mentioning the side effects because they think it's just part and parcel of the whole thing. Um, and we saw some really harrowing comments in the opening video from women who sound as if they're at the wit's end in managing them, you know, like are the side effects of treatment the price we pay to get rid of breast cancer? And some women feeling like they're judged for complaining about side effects and feeling like other people see, seeing them as not being strong enough or tough enough. So these are pretty hard conversations to have. But Jenny, um, but, um, actually I might go to you first, Navina. Um, I imagine that talking about these things is quite important. From the patient perspective, have you felt like you've had an outlet to vent your frustration about long-term side effects? Because you've had a heap. And are they common complaints that you've heard? Uh, absolutely common complaints, uh, Annabelle. And um, I think one of the first things I tell people, other people, is to tell your healthcare professional if you see something or feel something that doesn't feel right. Uh, even if you think you expect them, uh, just tell them because there could be uh, stuff that can be done to help. Um, one of my favorite sayings is, you know, hair growing back is one of the worst things that happens to a cancer patient, uh, mainly because of the speed with which it grows back, because people's experience with illnesses tend to be, if you look fine, you feel fine. And so they see your hair growing back and they think, oh, you're done now, is everything fine? And you go, no, I feel like crap. Um, and it takes at least a couple of years to feel human again, uh, is another one of my favorite sayings. But um, I think the most important thing is to find your tribe. Uh, and by that, I mean, um, you know, the, the friends who you can, who, who are your confidants, who are willing to take on the burden with you um, of 
um, the frustration and the the anxiety and so on that comes with uh, cancer and cancer treatment. Uh, the other thing is you actually find new friends uh, when you go through this because you find other cancer patients and they often get it. They understand it uh, more than somebody else who hasn't been through it. And so you kind of go, oh, you know, the whatever, you know, the phenopathy and like, oh yeah, isn't it crazy? And I'm like, yes, oh, it's horrible. And so on. Um, journaling, which Jenny mentioned was really useful. Um, the other thing I use for my own sake, um, is a model by a man called Stephen Covey. It's called the circle of influence, circle of control and circle of concern. And, I adopted it a long time ago, but it's really pertinent for me with this because I worry about the stuff I can control and perhaps influence. And there are things that I can't change. And I've had to learn to let it go because I could get tied up in knots over something that I can't actually do anything about. Uh, and it's a waste of my time, I've decided. So um, I'd rather garden or play with my dog or hang out with my family and friends. So, um, so, but yes, it's very common. Such a great point, Namina. And I wonder if you could say something quickly about managing other people's perceptions, because I know that um, breast cancer treatments have come such a long way in the last 25 years that sometimes you get a diagnosis and everybody around you is saying, you'll be fine. I mean, it's not 20 years ago. You'll be totally yes. fine, which may, may be slightly out of step with your own perceptions of the situation, right? Uh, I think people struggle with chronic illnesses and long-term illnesses because they think, oh, you know, you, so you get the help in the beginning and you get people swarming you with offers and then it peters out because they go, oh, are you still sick? Are you still unwell? Haven't you gotten, like, haven't, haven't you finished treatment? Haven't you gotten over that? Um, so it's quite challenging. And, and I, I use my voice, I guess, in forums like this, but also with family and friends, um, to explain to them that, um, you know, not only should you be kind to yourself, but you have to, they have to have patience with you because you're not the same person and you never will be. Uh, no matter, no matter what, whether you recover quickly or not, you're never the same person again. And so people need to be patient with you because they can't expect from you what they got pre diagnosis and pre treatment. Yeah. And then sometimes you find out amazing things about yourself too, right? Navina? Yes. And, you know, I'm, I think I'm a happier person now than I was before in a lot of ways. And I think, um, you know, I think I enjoy my life more than I used to. That's amazing to hear. Thank you, Navina. And thank you again for your participation in this panel. Um, hearing from people like you is worth its weight in gold for the thousands of people that are on this call. So thank you for your generos generosity and allowing us to poke around and hear about your nails. Um, now, we do have some provisional revolt results from the poll, um, split quite evenly between responses. Um, 17% said that research into fear of recurrence and joint pain and stiffness were the top priorities. 14% say chemo fog should be the next research priority and 12% say peripheral neuropathy. I'm just impressed that I can say peripheral neuropathy, so it's a low bar. Um, no change to the first poll results over the course of the session. We've still got 56% of people who say that they've had a number of side effects during treatment and have managed them to the best of their abilities. Now, we are fast running out of time, and I want to congratulate our panel for clawing back some time. We have made it through all the questions, so thank you very much for your brevity. Uh, but I want to quickly open the same question up to the panel that we just asked the audience and ask where you'd like to see research going in the future that has the most benefit to patients and improves quality of life. Naveena, do you have a preference? Well, if I was being selfish, joint pain and peripheral neuropathy are two biggies exactly. along with chemo fog. So thank you. Thank you to the, 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 the masses. Uh, but I think what hasn't come up there, which is sexual health, um, is another big one because it's often not spoken about and it's that hidden problem uh, that pretty much I'm guessing every woman who goes through uh, cancer treatment faces. And medical practitioners are completely happy to talk about this with you, so don't be icked about asking. Uh, Jenny, what would you like to see resources going towards? 
Oh, look, if we could get eradicate cancer full stop, that'd be bloody awesome. Um, but, you know, second to that, I think, look, peripheral neuropathy, there's lots of things that we can offer for a lot of the side effects, but peripheral neuropathy is one thing that is very hard. You know, pretty much there's nothing that we can say. There's no magic pill exercise doesn't overly help it. And in actual fact, if you've got severe peripheral neuropathy, it's going to limit your exercise. So I think that's quite an important area because it, it can be a major problem. Also nerve confusion and rice. Thank you, Navina. Um, Bruce, what's your pick? Uh, my pick is I think we need research into better breast screening so that we find more cancers early and then work out how little treatment can be given to get great outcomes. So find them early, optimise the treatment, um, and then there will be fewer side effects we have to deal with. That's a great answer, Bruce, and brings us back to Naveena's story from the beginning. And finally, Nick, what about you? Yeah, I, I, I think finding the patients who need less treatment uh, and um, then avoiding those treatments that they don't really need to avoid the side effects from them. I think that's really important. Big brains and big computers. Thank you, Nick, and thank you to, um, well, to the whole panel, Navina, Bruce, Jenny and Nick for your advice and guidance. Thank you for bringing us in two minutes over time only. So that was extremely um, efficient of you all. Um, we wanted to get you out of out of here on time, given that everybody's got lives to return to. Thank you all for giving so generously of your uh, time this evening. As I mentioned before, this Q&A has been recorded and will be available on the Breast Cancer Trials website from tomorrow. So the team will send everybody a link to be able to watch or share. Uh, breast Cancer Trials, as you know, is committed to improving outcomes for every person diagnosed with breast cancer through clinical clinical trials research. Thank you to all who participate. Um, they also look to the community to help support this important research. So if you or your family or friends would like to make a donation, you can also do that at the website at www.breastcancertrials.org.au. And lastly, I'd like to thank the 2,600 people who registered for this session and extend all of our best wishes to you and as much light and revelation as is possible um, on this journey. Thank you so much and good night.